Hello, welcome to News Now on TV 360 Nigeria. I am Fidelia Aguncha. We begin tonight's bulletin on a sad note as nine persons have been confirmed dead in an accident along the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. The Ogun State Sector Commander of the Federal Road Safety Corps, Clement Oladili, also confirmed five persons were injured in the accident, which involved a bus and a truck. Oladili says a total of 42 persons were involved in the accident, which are 34 males and 8 females. He added that 3 males and 2 female adults were injured, while 7 male and 2 female adults died in the accident. Oladili also says the accident was a result of overspeeding on the part of the bus driver. Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari has opened a new ECOWAS border post at the Seme border in Badagri, Lagos State. The president opened the border alongside his Benin Republic counterpart, Patrice Talon. At the event, Buhari pledged that Nigeria will work closely with the Republic of Benin to ensure the success of the newly inaugurated border post. He described the project aimed at enhancing the free movement of persons and goods in the region as a symbol of integration that brings together the people of Nigeria and Benin. The president says it will enhance trade facilitation by combining border clearance activities in a single location and increase cooperation as well as coordination. The Nigerian Senate has passed the Electoral Act Amendment Bill for a fourth time. The passage follows the adoption of the report by the Joint Senate and House of Representative Committee on the bill. Now, President Buhari had withdrawn assent to the bill three times, raising various constitutional and drafting issues. The committee addressed the issues raised by the president in a harmonized fourth version of the bill. After today's passage, Senate President Bukola Saraki expressed hope that the president will assent to the current version of the bill. It will be forwarded to the president after approval by the House of Representatives. The Kaduna state government has relaxed the 24-hour curfew declared on Sunday in Kaduna Metropolis and other parts of the state with immediate effect. State spokesperson Samuel Arawan says the decision was reached after deliberation by the state security council. Arawan says the curfew in Kasuan, Magani and Kujama will now be enforced from dusk to dawn, that is from 5 p.m. in the evening to 6 a.m. in the morning, while that of Kaduna Metropolis has been eased off to give residents between 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. to restock on essentials. The spokesperson, however, noted that security agents will still patrol and protect the markets to ensure safety and deal with any attempts by hoodlums to engage in criminal conduct. A federal high court in Abuja has adjourned to November 19, 2018, a case of alleged corruption and diversion of public funds brought against it against National Chairman of the All Progressives Congress, Adam Zoshomale. The case, which was instituted by an Edo State Indigen, Bishop Osadolo Oche, is asking the court to compel the EFCC to investigate the former governor of Edo State. Our correspondent, Tunji Oye, now reports. Witnessing the trial of the National Chairman of the All Progressive Congress, Adam Soshomale, in this court. A petition was written in 2016 to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, on alleged corruption and diversion of public funds by Oshomale while presiding over the affairs of Edo State as governor. The petitioner, Bishop Osadolo Oche, alleged that the EFCC willfully refused to investigate the former governor despite several petitions and documentary evidences eventually secured the powers of the court to summon both the EFCC and Oshiomole. I'm a man that has been denied good governance as a human rights activist, as an anti-corruption crusader. If you come to the area I dwell, I classified it as government rejected area. That is where I dwell. For over the years, particularly since Comrade Adam Oshiomole came on board, no razor blade have entered that area. In those days, they do great rules, 
once December, uh, January. But from 2007 till today, as I speak, all the roads in where I stay, Ward 5, in the Koboha local government area, is in deplorable condition. And we went ahead to investigate and came up with some documents with which the monies were stolen or diverted or misappropriated. So on the basis of that, I approached EFCC with concrete petition. Came to EFCC in 2016. I've been writing, publishing, and been doing all sorts of things. They never cared to listen. At the resumed hearing of the matter on Tuesday, EFCC did not show up in court. But counsel to Adam Soshio Mole told the court that an application has been filed to determine if the petitioner has a local standing to sue Adam Soshio Mole. We have seen the paperwork that has been filed and uh, there is absolutely nothing to be bothered about. Absolutely nothing to be bothered about. Uh, apart from the factual issues uh, which the court will decide, we have raised technical issues as regards uh, the competence of the action. Uh, before a court of law will assume jurisdiction to hear a case and decide it, the court must be satisfied, one, that the plaintiff is a proper plaintiff who has a law cost standard to approach the court. Once you have satisfied that, the court will now ask itself the question, this plaintiff, has he come to court within the time specified by law? So even if you have a right to approach the courts and you go and sleep on your rights and decide to approach the courts at a time that is politically expedient or convenient for you, you have to contend with convincing the court that your action is brought within time. We were here the last time. We could have gone for hearing today, but you see that EFCC was not represented. Uh, uh, Comrade Shimon has been represented by a very eminent lawyer and who served us today with a preliminary objection on the basis that they are challenging the local standing of the applicant as well as the fact that the matter may be statute bad. We will now respond to this and the matter has been set down for hearing of this preliminary objection uh, on the 19th of this month and hopefully a ruling as the court may please. The matter has been adjourned to the 19th of November to determine the application of the first defendant. From Abuja, Sunjoye, TV360 News. The House of Representatives has resolved to set up another committee to investigate the raging crisis at the National Health Insurance Scheme. The committee has been given four weeks to complete the assignment and a crisis was triggered by the refusal of the Executive Secretary of the NHIS, Usman Yusuf, to adhere to his suspension by the governing council of the scheme for allegedly inflating the scheme's 2018 budget. The board suspended Yusuf for fraudulently inflating the cost of biometric capturing machines, attempting to illegally execute 30 billion naira in federal government bond, excessive arrogation of project vehicles, among others. However, Yusuf insists only the president has the power to suspend him. Officials of the scheme have also appealed to President Muhammad Buhari to intervene in the crisis. No, when we see wrong things, because my children, uh, we, most of us are children are not, no school, no work. Eh? And somebody will be eating the whole Nigerian money here. Eh? So, we are calling for President Buhari to come and check this man, Professor Usman Yusuf, in this NHIS. Please, he's, because he said it's only you that is fighting corruption, that it's only you can come and fight and check him. So, Buhari, please come. It was his own insistence that he must come to the office because he did not recognize the authority that suspended him. The acting executive secretary has already started working. He has dished out instruction, carrying out the implementing the the boss decision already, and we will abide by it. And he claimed that there are people up there who are defending him. Meanwhile, let him call those people so that we know them. If it's Buhari, we are more Buhari than him. An Abuja High Court has ruled that the federal government's alleged looters list released earlier in the year does not constitute a violation of the rights to assumption of innocence of those named. The judge, Justice Olukayade Adeniyi, dismissed the suit filed by the proprietor of the African Independent Television and Ray Power Radio, 
Raymond Dukmesi, seeking the court's declaration of the looters' list as void. Justice Adini, however, ruled that the disclosure of the alleged looters' list by the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, does not carry any force of law as the minister is neither the judge or prosecutor in any criminal case. The judge also ruled that aggrieved persons can seek remedy through a libel or slander suit. Meanwhile, Vice President Himio Shibajo is seeking the cooperation of all Nigerians in the fight against corruption. Oshibajo, who was speaking at a national economic summit in Abuja, says the government was having a hard time eradicating corruption but insisted that they will not relent. He, however, noted that corruption can only be completely defeated if all Nigerians join hands and work together. This challenge through the years has been governance and institutional weaknesses. Systemic corruption, integrity and inefficiency in our public service and the administration of justice system. We've taken a strong stand on corruption, especially grand corruption, but there's still a long way to go. Cleaning up systemic corruption is, as you can imagine and as you know, a difficult task. By its very nature, systemic corruption always fights back using the very institutions that are to be reformed. And I believe that we have to keep focused, we have to keep vigilant and alert, and all, and when you require all of the corrupt collaboration of the private sector, all of the collaboration of the professions in ensuring that we're able to deliver on the governance issues that, so, that, that have so uh, damaged a lot of the progress that we could, we could have made. Nigerians have been reminded not to hurriedly forget the sacrifices of the founding fathers and lots more those who paid the ultimate price for the nation. Some activists gave the advice at the unveiling of Onyenkuzi, a 350-page book of the life and times of Ruben Uzoma in Abuja. The book Onyenkuzi is a historical biography which offers insights into the immeasurable contributions of the late Ruben Ibekwe Uzoma to nation building and education in Nigeria. The book title is derived from Uzoma's early career sobriquet as a young teacher and educator. It was popularly referred to as Onyenkuzi, meaning the teacher, counselor or simply someone who leads the way. Nigerians have been urged to emulate the pivotal contributions of this icon of education and other great men and women. The fathers of this nation who fought so hard, how are we paying them back? Every time I hear the national, the national anthem, those words, that the labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. Can we truly say, as we are seated here, all of us here, as we are in this room, have we indeed made sure that the labor of our heroes past is not in vain? The lessons of today are enormous. As we extract the works of our forebears, learn from what they did to moderate our present actions. Let us pray that their actions will spur us and their mistakes we redirect us in our action. On our part, Adara Okwasa, the author of Onyenkuzi and daughter of the academic luminary, says the release of the book serves to unfold certain events in Nigeria that held out so much promise. By 2012, my primary sources for any knowledge of Ara Uzoma would be his students or his colleagues at work. When, I, when Arai passed on in 2012, he was 88 years old. By 2012, he would have been 100 years old. So even his students or his colleagues... The book launch was graced by friends, colleagues and admirers who turned out in their numbers for this masterpiece on fascinating biography of a well-known education colossus of our generation. Uni Adekunle, TV360, Nigeria. Meanwhile, the political class and indeed all Nigerians have been advised to listen and reflect on the messages embedded in the music of Afrobeat legend Fela and Nicola Bokuti. Speakers at a public presentation of the book, Fela Yesterday's Message as Today's Reality, believe that Fela's songs still connect with present-day challenges and will help the nation tackle its problems. 
everybody talks about the fact that oh fella sings about our problems uh, our fella sang about everything but we also don't sit down to analyze some of those songs what are exactly their words and in what way do they connect with our problems so what this book will be adding for example is that in-depth analysis that i made of a three of his numbers that most younger generation people didn't even know are just like that which you know spoke about so many issues of electricity of uh, you know bad governance and we're talking of way back you know in the 19 you know 80s and then also analyze you know country of pain and government of crooks no fella cannot be exhausted i mean he's a universal genius i was saying to uh, another person who interviewed me that is isn't to note, to note is that Fela is not a Nigerian icon, he's a universal icon, he's a legend. He's already at the level of persons who, with their efforts, with their originality, with the quality of their efforts, with their genius, have ascended to the level of persons in the world who are identified, celebrated, known, you know, um, promoted on the basis of the fact that they have reached that high level where they are one name geniuses. I have just come to Lagos as a secondary school class three dropout and I, I was working in a factory. A factory laborer in Lagos in 1969 who would not respond to the phenomenon of Fela and Nicola Bokuti would be a completely dead human being. Because whatever you suffered in the Nigerian society at that time, only one man conclusively gave expression to it in public pronouncement in the way Fela, Fela did. You're still watching news now on TV 360 Nigeria. We will be right back after this break. Stay with us. The Wale Shoinka Award for Investigative Reporting is here again. Are you a Nigerian journalist or team of journalists working full-time or freelance? Do you have investigative stories on regulatory failures, corruption in public and corporate sectors, or human rights abuses published between 4th October 2017 and 3rd October 2018? You can now submit your works for the 13th Wale Shoinka Award for Investigative Reporting. Award categories include print, radio, television, photo, online and editorial cartoon. Submission deadline is Wednesday, 24th October 2018 by 4 p.m. Winners will receive cash prizes, gifts and international travel opportunities worth 1 million naira. Other finalists will also be rewarded. Submit all entries apart from the online category at the WSCIG office, 18A Abiodushobajo Street, off Latif Jakonde Road, Agidingbi, Ikeja, Lagos. For more information, please visit www.wscij.org or call 0908-251-5179. Welcome back. Let us now join Aneta Felix for the latest in business. Hello, Aneta. Hello, Fidelia. So we know the Nigerian government, and uh, Nigeria actually, is one of um, a number of other African countries that failed to sign the AFCTA agreement. And um, they have been given more reasons why they actually, that is President Buhari, has been given reasons why he actually declined to sign that agreement. Uh, could you tell us more about that, please? Well, that's true. And take, taking a step, a step further, the president has actually inaugurated a, a presidential committee for impact and readiness assessment of the African continental free trade area. Uh, at the event, the presidential, at the presidential villa, Abuja, Buhari warned that Nigeria will not sign any treaty without assessing its impact on the lives of Nigerians. The president said that Nigeria will take its time to break away from past practice where treaties were signed without meeting the needs uh, and positive gains for the country. The African Continental Free Trade Area is an agreement which can become largest free trade area in terms of participating countries since the formation of the World Trade Organization. 49 countries, including South Africa, have signed the AFCTA, leaving out just six countries, including Nigeria. President Mohamed Buhari, at in May, hinted at his readiness to sign the deal, and the inauguration of this committee for impact and readiness assessment is seen as the first step in that direction. The committee will be chaired by the Minister of Industry, 
Trade and Investment, Okechuku and Nelama. It will also be co-chaired by the Chief of Staff to the President, Abakiyari. At this inauguration ceremony, the chairman reminds its members of the terms of reference. While many stakeholders support the African continental free trade area, there are some important stakeholders who are concerned about the impact of the AFCFTA. Those, sec those stakeholders who support the African continental free trade area agreement point to the market opportunities for growth for Nigerian exporters of goods and services, the scope for industrialization through economies of scale in a single market, the mechanisms for solving and resolving trade disputes, cooperative mechanisms for regulating and promoting intra-Africa trade, and the African continental free trade area as a platform for Nigeria's continued leadership in Africa, as Africa remains the centerpiece of Nigeria's African policy. In his address, President Mohamed Buhari notes that he would only sign the agreement if the committee agrees that it will benefit all Nigerians. The creation of this free trade area is a worthy and commendable idea. Clearly, the population, resources, geographical spread, and the other theoretical trade indicators of the continent highlight the tremendous potential that exists if we can crack the various barriers that hinder intra African trade. However, although this assertion makes easier sense in theory, the reality of doing business in Africa poses its own peculiar challenges. You will all recall that some months ago, the Vice President at an event reminded Nigerians that the concept of free trade implies a fundamental assumption of the level and competitive playing field that is fair. For those of you who are in business, I am sure you will all agree that Africa's trade landscape as it stands is multifaceted. For us in Nigeria, our vision for intra-African trade is for the free movement of made in Africa goods. This means the goods and services must have significant African content in terms of raw materials and value addition. The committee would also include ministers of budget and national planning, foreign affairs, finance, justice and the economic advisor to the president as members. All the members are representatives of Nigerian Governors Forum, President Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and President Nigerian Labour Congress, among others, as members. Adeshewa Udushoga, TV360, Nigeria. Telecommunications giant MTN Group Limited has confirmed it is still engaging the Nigerian authorities to find an equitable resolution to the controversial $8.1 billion demand. The group also advised shareholders to continue to exercise caution when dealing with the company's securities until a further announcement is made. In August 2018, the Central Bank of Nigeria had ordered MTN and four other banks to pay a refund uh, of uh, $8.134 billion, billion dollars actually, uh, which was moved out of the country for breaching the country's forex regulations. The CBN also slammed a huge $5.84 billion fine on the banks for allegedly aiding MTN in the illegal capital repatriation. So we'll take a break now and we'll be right back with the Stock Market Review. Do stay with us. The bulls dominated the market today as the all share index edged by 0.69%, bringing the market capitalization to 12.117 trillion naira. And 3,180 deals took place on the NSE today, and they were all worth 2.3%. 50 billion naira. Now, making the most profit from today's trade is Nestle Nigerian PLC, Dangote Cement, First Bank of Nigeria Holdings, and Dangote uh, Flower. Though the shares of Nestle Nigerian PLC increased by 30 naira or 2. 
0.19% as it traded uh, its share at 1,400 naira. Or Unilever Nigeria PLC is also the biggest loser today, declining further from its last close at 47.5 naira uh, per share to 45.65 naira today. And it's not just the share price of Unilever that's declining. The volume of shares traded actually declined from 4.850 million naira yesterday, million shares yesterday, uh, to just 1.8. 988 million shares today. Now let's take a look at our top traders. We see that First City Monument Bank, Transnational Corporation Guarantee, and Axis Bank, you know, are actually making the most trades. First City Monument Bank sold a total of 27.511 million shares, uh, worth 42.804 million naira. And on the global stock market, we see that uh, the global stocks are rattled by uncertainty around Brexit, news that the European Commission had just rejected Italy's budget proposal, international tensions with Saudi Arabia, and that's over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, fears about China's economy, and poor news from U.S. companies. Well, sell-offs on the FTSE are accelerating as the market closed about 87 points lower at 6,955.21 basis points, or 1.24%. Well, the winners in the London Stock Exchange are led by British American Tobacco, which actually climbed 4.1%. And for uh, for the U.S., it's actually been a scary month for investors as the Dow actually plunged about 5.7%, and that's about the steepest monthly percentage decline since August 2015. But still, it was, it was not all bad news from corporate America as McDonald Corporation recorded gains. And analysts also say that with uh, earnings with with uh, earnings growth still very strong, the markets might actually begin to look attractive and Neki here in Asia is sadly reverting from its gains yesterday to decline by minus one by minus two point six seven percent and that's it for me Fidelia well, thank you, Aneta. Bearish marketing was all through the stock market, like in Nigeria and across the world today, wasn't it? No, it was actually bullish in Nigeria, just on the global scene. Uh, and the thing actually is that for uh, the global stock here, analysts have actually been saying that uh, um, what actually happened at the European Commission today, you know, Italy submitted its draft proposal and this was rejected by the Economic Commission. They say it's too high and that Italy needs to cut it down. And if, if you might know, this actually is the first time that the European Commission is doing this to any of its member states. And of course, uh, the Dow Jones uh, uh, keep going low, keep going low because uh, shareholders are selling off. And especially uh, FTSE right here, you know, there is speculation that Brexit is actually making the stock market keep crashing. And I think that until investigation surrounding the death of Jamal Khashoggi is resolved, the global stock might continue to go down as well. Wow, thank you so much, Aneta. Thank you for that knowledge. Well, still to come, Turkish President Recep Erdogan has a lot to say about the death of Jamal Khashoggi. After this break, stay with us. In the last three years, we have built a multi-purpose center, which is the envy of all in our constituency. And I can tell you that the people who are living there are already enjoying it. Guy, do you think what this man just said is true? See, I seriously doubt. I'm sure it's one of those that are silly lies. And hey, wait, do you know there's a way to find out if these things he's saying is true or not? Ah. This is the construct app. It gives people like us a sure way to track implementation of constituency projects. It gives valid and verified information on location of projects, amounts allocated, amounts funded, the level of job done, and even the profiles of concerned legislators. You and I can post directly on this app. Are you serious? This is the GoTo app. If you want to know how our commonwealth is being expanded by the government. Wow. Let's even see if what this man said is true. Show me. The Construct app is developed by Other People Nigeria with support from USAID and is available on both Google Play Store and Apple Store. Eh? Yeah. And it's true. <laughs> of course, I told you. Welcome back. Turkey's president is alleging that journalist Jamal Khashoggi was killed in a savage pre-planned murder at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, directly contradicting the Gulf Kingdom's account of the commentator's death. The accusations by Recep Erdogan are the most detailed 
to be made in public by Ankara since Khashoggi's disappearance this month, significantly raising the pressure on the Saudi royal family as it hosts a high-profile investment conference. It also puts the spotlight back on the Saudi leadership after a week in which it attempted to draw a line on that, on that disappearance. Now, Khashoggi's killing has triggered more international condemnation of the Gulf state um, at any point since Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman took um, de facto control last year. And in sports, Niger Super Falcons have been drawn in Group B of the 2018 African Women Cup of Nations scheduled to hold in Ghana. The Falcons are in the group alongside South Africa, Kenya and Zambia. They are heading into the tournament as defending champions and will be looking at picking up one of the three World Cup sports available at the tournament. But just how far can the Falcons go? Our correspondent, Oni Adekunli, has been finding out. The Super Falcons will head into the tournament in confident form, buoyed by 7-0 thrashing of Zambia in their qualifying match. They begin this year's tournament with a group game against South Africa before games against Zambia and Kenya. It will be the ninth meeting between Nigeria and South Africa at the Alcon. Kenya will be making just a second appearance, while Zambia will be making a third appearance. Sports analysts in Nigeria believe the Falcons and the Bayana Bayana should be strong enough to make it through the groups. It's a pretty straightforward group. From what I see, I think it should be between Nigeria and the Bayana Bayana of South Africa. But um, as it stands, it could have been, it could have been worse because uh, Equatorial Guinea actually qualified. They were eliminated on the technicality having, using, having used uh, an ineligible player. That's why Kenya got in. Uh, but it's a straightforward shootout between Nigeria and uh, by, the Bayana Bayana of South Africa. So that's the way I see it. In, in African uh, uh, female football, we will have probably just about four or five teams. Uh, uh, the perennial ones, the old block, Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Cameroon. And then you, know, you also have Equ Equatorial, uh, Equatorial Guinea, you know. So uh, uh, in that group, the only people that have given Nigeria maybe a little bit of resistance has to be uh, the, South, the South Africans. But I tell you, uh, uh, I'm seeing probably at the end of the day, Nigeria is going to top the group. They will win all their matches, only bearing these circumstances, because uh, the quality of the opposition in Africa is not there. Uh, it is just the Equatorial Guineans, you know, now who are not in this competition, that will say yes, they can offer uh, uh, a much of, um, uh, how do I say, much of a, a, simple, a little fight to the Super Falcons. Nigeria are strong favorites for the tournament. The Falcons have won 10 of the 12 editions and are the current defending champions. However, it has been tough for the team since the last victory in 2016. They went nearly a year without a coach after the NFF failed to renew the contract for Florence Omagbemi. New coach Thomas Denaby was only hired in January 2018 and lost his first game 8-0 to France. It was the Falcons' first game in over a year and Koiki believes such poor preparations will hamper the team's chances in Ghana. Honestly, I don't think so. The reason being, like I said, this team hasn't played any football in the past two years. They've been virtually inactive. A lot of these players haven't met, they've only met up twice in two years. That doesn't build, that's not good for team chemistry, it's not good for match fitness, it's not good for understanding. You also have a new coach, Thomas Denneby, who has only been in charge of this team, I think, uh, effectively for six games. There was a waffle tournament early this year when Anja lost out in the semi-finals. It's difficult for him to prune down this number and get a team that would be good enough to face the rest of Africa at the Africa uh, Women's Championship. So it's pretty tough. Uh, these players don't know themselves quite well. They haven't played together in quite a while. The, also, the, uh, the, the captain, Evelyn Wamboko, has also been, was not called up as well. So it's a team that might be short on experience, high on talent, but I'm, I'm not confident about their chances, really. Ochanoga is, however, more optimistic of the team's chances. You know, individually, uh, uh, we, the, the, the players are technically gifted. They are experienced. You know, uh, so uh, in, in fact, the other African teams do not have our players playing professional football all over the world, the way our players are playing in, in, in America, in Europe, in China. The main, the main mention of Asad Oshwala, I mean, some of them get shivers. You know, are, are, you, are you getting me? So, you, 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 the strength of it is, is they have a, a good team. They have a good, a good, def a compact defense. They have a, 
a, a midfield and they have a good a very 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 good attack but what is going for them is that this team has been together in a very is an evolu, you know evolving team they keep on evolving and they you know some of them here in, in spite of their ages have been to about two or three nations cup already so what are we talking about here so basically um the, their strength to me is not in the individual in individual uh, 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 talents that they have, but in that uh, uh, synergy that the team has working together as a team. The 2019 Total African Women Cup of Nations is scheduled to take place in Ghana between November 17 and December 1, 2018. Oni Adekunle, TV 360, Nigeria. Oh, that's our bulletin for tonight. Do log on to our website at TV360 Nigeria for more news updates and download our app from Play Store. It is TV360 Nigeria. I am Fidelia Agunja. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.